Hey everyone, welcome to the third to last class and lecture of the entire year. Almost done. Almost done with everything. I'm um, going to try to bang out these last three years of the war, 1863, 1864, 1865 each uh, with our own class. 63 today. Um, it is a super duper important year. Uh, turning point of the war is going to come um, and it's going to be all downhill for the Confederacy. 64 uh, will be pretty bloody, but it won't be super long. And then 65 will be very short. So um, this will be the longest lecture that you have left. A couple more questions to add. Uh, just about done with our activity sheets with our last grade for the year. Uh, so make sure you're checking your grade if you um, haven't done everything and you want to get your grade up, do the stuff that's been assigned throughout the Arctic Academy lessons and get those grades up. Um, if not, if you're happy with where, where your grade is at, okay, that's fine. I get it. Um, please watch these. Please watch. Pay attention. Ask me any questions that you have. Uh, shoot me a message. I've had some really good questions so far. So, um, you know, just try to uh, familiarize yourself with the content so at least you've heard it and um, you're familiar with it. So, um, 1863, uh, this is going to be a very bloody year and the turning point of the war. Just so we remember where we're at, uh, the blockade, it is heating up. Uh, the uh, three-part anaconda plan is going pretty well uh, with part one with the blockade. The longer the war goes, the better the blockade is going to be for the Union because they're churning out more ships. Um, they're getting more ships in place, and so that uh, vice is tightening on the Confederacy, and they are able to smuggle in less and less stuff. Remember the uh, Monitor, uh, the Merrimack, and the Virginia, uh, the Ironclad's battle um, essentially ensured that the Confederates won't have a secret weapon to be able to destroy the blockade, so it's uh, going very well. As is the campaign for the Mississippi. We talked last year, 1862, uh, Grant especially, but also David Farragut down in New Orleans, uh, they are they made large contributions to capturing uh, the Mississippi River, which is part two of the Anaconda Plan that is going to cut off the Confederacy, or cut it in two, and allow the Mississippi to be a highway for the Union for moving goods, for men, supplies, all of that invasion routes, stuff like that. So, that's going pretty well. It's not quite 100% done, but it will be soon. Um, the war in the East, though, a disaster for the Union. Um, we, and by we, I mean the Union is uh, Ofer. They have uh, tried, they have invaded the South. They have invaded uh, Virginia a couple of times. It has failed every time. Um, so we have had um, four. Yeah. Four, four invasions. Um, McDowell, Irvin McDowell, invaded at Bull Run uh, early in uh, 1861. He failed and was fired. Uh, George B. McClellan tried at the Peninsula Campaign, the Seven Days Battle. He failed and was fired. Uh, a guy that we didn't even talk about uh, named uh, John Pope, he uh, tried at Bull Run again. There was a second Bull Run. Uh, he failed and was fired. Uh, and then the most handsome of all the generals, Ambrose Burnside, he tried at Fredericksburg, was humiliated, and was fired. He has now been replaced with a man named Joseph Hooker. So uh, he will get his shot in 1863 to invade uh, and probably fail in the East. The only kind of good news in the East uh, is that uh, the one time that Robert E. Lee did try to invade Union territory, he did fail at the Battle of Antietam. Kind of a draw, depending on what source you're looking at and who you're listening to. They'll tell you more often than not, you know, it was a tie. But Lee did uh, retreat. He did go back into Virginia uh, and didn't do any further damage. Uh, so uh, it was enough. Uh, we can call it a loss. So that's kind of okay. You know, the, the Union didn't lose a battle in the North, but they haven't won any battles in the South. In the East, only in the West with guys like uh, Grant uh, and Sherman and Farragut are things going okay. Last thing that happened was the Emancipation Proclamation that is going into effect January 1st, 1863. In the wake of uh, the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln says, hey, it's time to do something about slavery. That something at this point is to declare all slaves free 
in the rebelling territory. So remember, if you are a slave area, if you are a slave state, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, about to be West Virginia, if you are a slave area and you're not rebelling, you can keep your slaves as of now thanks to the Emancipation Proclamation. So, into 1863, uh, a couple battles to go through today. The first is uh, the most embarrassing for the Union and the greatest victory in Lee's very storied career. It is the Battle of Chancellorsville. It's a little bit longer of a battle. It's, uh, we just passed the um, anniversary of it. It's May 1st to May 5th. Um, it's it's pretty embarrassing if you are Joseph Hooker. He has about 130,000 men. Now, keep in mind, when this war started, Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers for 90 days, right? He thought he was going to need 75,000 guys for three months. Here we are a couple of years later, one army, and this isn't everyone in the Union Army, right? The, the Union Army is fighting in multiple places at the same time all throughout the Confederacy. Just one of those armies has 130,000 men. Hooker takes that army and he splits it up into three, and he's trying to trap Robert E. Lee. And Lee only has 60,000 guys. This is where you're really starting to see, at this point, the war has been pretty bloody. It has been much longer than uh, either side expected. And this is where you really start to see the, the weight of the numbers start to take its toll. So um, Lee has less than half of the guys that uh, Hooker does. However, Lee is going to go against the book and he is going to be ultra aggressive um, in this situation. He knows he is cornered. He knows he's trapped. He knows he's in trouble. So instead of sitting and playing defense the way you're you're taught, the way he was taught at West Point, uh, where he was one of the top you know graduates in his class, he actually goes on the offensive, and he also splits his army up. Most famously in this battle, he orders Stonewall Jackson right. Uh, local guy here he's from what is now Clarksburg, West Virginia. He engages part of Hooker's army, which you is what, what you're looking at in this map here. He takes some of his guys and engages Hooker's army in the front, uh, which is dangerous because he is outnumbered and making it even more dangerous. He has Jackson sneak around Hooker's flank to try to get into uh, the rear of the line. Now, Hooker's not expecting this. The Union Army's not expecting this. No one's expecting this because this is the opposite of what you are taught in places like West Point. If you're outnumbered, you shouldn't further dilute your strength by uh, splitting your army up. But Lee does it. Now, he gets lucky in that he's able to hold in the front, right? This whole thing would have been a disaster if Hooker uh, was better, was more decisive, and used the weight of his numbers to uh, attack more effect uh, effectively, but he didn't. So Jackson is able to sneak around uh, to the rear of the Union line, but it takes all day. And uh, unfortunately for Lee, and fortunately for the Union, this attack is not quite as devastating as it could have been. Had Jackson been able to get around uh, the, the flank a little quicker and had more daylight, this could have been a really damaging attack. Unfortunately, Jackson has to call off the attack thanks to nightfall because, as we're about to see, uh, it's very difficult in the Civil War to fight at night. Uh, so Jackson calls off the attack, and then he personally goes scouting. Jackson personally goes out on a little scouting mission to see where's the Union line, uh, where should we attack come first daylight. Unfortunately for Lee, unfortunately for the Confederacy, and most unfortunate for uh, Stonewall Jackson, on his way back to his own camp, um, a guard mistakes him for a Union soldier and shoots him in the left arm. Now, because this is the Civil War, um, the technology of the guns and the bullets are such that his arm ha can't be saved. It has to be amputated. Also, thanks to uh, the technology or lack thereof, uh, Jackson is going to suffer from an infection and will eventually die about a week later. But it does lead us to uh, things like uh, this awesome grave of the arm of Stonewall Jackson on May uh, that is buried May 3rd. He dies a week later. 
Um, and this is going to be a huge blow for the Confederate Army. Lee says Jackson lost his left arm. I have lost my right because he is his right-hand man. Every time Lee wants to do something bold, every time Lee wants to do something a little crazy, um, has, has, a, has a very difficult mission, has a daring mission, just like what we're seeing here, Jackson is the guy he turns to, and it's overstating it a little bit to say that he always gets it done, but Jackson is a very, very capable general. Jackson gets a lot more out of his men than most generals do. This, So this death, uh, this loss of, uh, of Jackson is going to be a huge loss for the Confederacy going forward, as we'll see um, in future battles. But Thanks to uh, the daring and the ability of guys like Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, <laughs> even though there is this crazy disparate, disparity in uh, the size of the force of the two armies, Chancellorsville turns into a huge um, Confederate victory. Again, it's super bloody. I mean, we're talking... A couple of days, 17,000 casualties for the Union, 12,000 casualties for the Confederates. So, uh, you know, for the Union, can, can they sustain that? Absolutely. I mean, 17,000 out of 130,000, uh, especially when you have so many more guys that they can just draft and call up, drop in the bucket. If you're already looking at if you're the Confederacy and you're already your 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 army's already being whittled down and you're at sixty thousand and having that many guys can be difficult. A twelve thousand casualties is a huge number. It's it's a it's a pretty big um, percentage, which is why Lee decides for a second time, second year in a row, Lee decides we're going to invade the Union. We are going to march north this time into Pennsylvania. We are going to try to um, give Virginia some breathing room, right? This is springtime. He's moving into the summer, so he's looking to go get some supplies from the north instead of having the north taking supplies from the south or destroying supplies in the south. He is going to go wreak havoc. Plus, Robert E. Lee is more or less undefeated. He is kind of becoming this mythical figure in the south and this feared figure in the north where people are thinking he just can't be beat. So he's thinking, maybe if I go north, I can give the south some time to recover. I can take the war to the north. I can put pressure on the Union government, on Lincoln, on D.C. Um, maybe if I win a battle or two up in uh, the Union territory north of the Mason-Dixon line, I can help bring this war to a quicker end. Does he have to do this to win the war? No. You just got to win by not losing. You just got to outlast. But he is thinking, the Confederates are thinking, if he marches north, which is what he's going to do here in 1863, if he marches north through Martinsburg uh, into uh, an area of central Pennsylvania, this will be a way to quicken uh, the end of the resolve of the Union, right? That's the way they are going to win this war. They're going to get the North, they're going to get the Union to just be tired of the war. He thinks if he can go into Pennsylvania and win some battles, maybe win a big battle, that will be enough to make uh, the Union quit. Now, Hooker gets fired. So once again, we've had yet another uh, fired general uh, on the uh, Union side in the East. He is going to be uh, be replaced with a, a guy named General George Meade. Uh, so Meade is now going to be in place, and we'll see what this dude can do. So real quick on that activity sheet, another question. How's the war going so far? Overall, if you're the Union, if you're Lincoln and you're looking at the war, uh, what are you saying is good? What are you saying is bad? Same for the Confederacy. If you're Jefferson Davis... Uh, and you had to take stock of how the war is going here in uh, early May of 1863. How's the war going? Because it's all about to change. Whatever you think, however you think it's going, if you're at least somewhat right, it's all about to change. But before that happens, the most important event in all of human history happens. West Virginia becomes a state, June 20th. 1863. Um, it took a little longer than it was supposed to because West Virginia could not get its act together over the issue of slavery. Um, 
as part of Virginia, slavery had always been allowed in what is now West Virginia. And when um, a lot of people, when people in mostly like Morgantown, Wheeling, uh, those kinds of areas said, hey, we don't want to secede. We want to stay as part of the Union. We uh, obviously uh, went to Lincoln. Lincoln was like, I don't know that it's legal. In fact, today there's a lot of debate still over if our statehood was legal. Um, at this point, it doesn't really matter because we are a state, but it was a little sketchy the way it came about. Um, but when we first drafted our, our constitution, uh, we said slavery is allowed here. End of story. Um, and Lincoln and Congress kind of said, you guys dumb? Like, do you not realize what this war is about and what we're fighting. Have you heard of the Emancipation Proclamation? We clearly don't want another slave state. Uh, so we work out a compromise. And actually, uh, there is a house, the Willie House, right beside Morgantown High. There is an, one of those awesome white historical markers in the yard, uh, right it's on Wagner, so it's right on, uh, right beside uh, Morgantown High. Uh, the Willie Amendment, uh, as it's known, is put into our Constitution that says slavery is legal here, but eventually we'll get rid of it. it we, we, so we provide for gradual emancipation. Um, and then Congress uh, allows it. So we become the 35th state, June 20th, 1863. Three. So we are a slave state, right? Of course, everything West Virginia does is a little slow, is a little backwards from a lot of states. And so we decided, hey, you know, this war uh, that's kind of against slavery, we're against it too. Um, but we'll be a slave state to do it. Um, not every part of what is now West Virginia wanted to be part of West Virginia. A lot of the border areas here, uh, like Greenbrier County, uh, they were brought over kicking and screaming. Same with the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, the Eastern Panhandle is much more like Northern Virginia, geographically, economically. It's a little different if you guys ever go over, uh, like for a game, to Martinsburg, to Musselman, stuff like that. You'll notice it's much flatter. Um, they're known for like their orchards of apples and stuff. Like you can't necessarily have that in most of West Virginia, um, right? It's not the coal mining areas, right? So it didn't really want to come, but Lincoln said, no, 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 you have to take the Eastern Panhandle because that's where important uh, rail centers were, like at Harper's Ferry. So it was also uh, pried away from Virginia. It wasn't super happy about it. Virginia wasn't super happy, and uh, it may not have been legal, but it is what it is, and now we have this weirdly shaped state. Uh, yeah, so like the green areas here especially were not, hmm, not really a big fan. And even in the places where you, um, where there wasn't a lot of resistance, you did find, especially like in the southern parts of the state over here, I'm looking at you, Kanawha County, uh, there was still uh, considerate Confederate sympathies. Um, so it wasn't just like, Every person in these areas were all good with it. Um, the further north you went, like into Morgantown, Morgantown got raided by, uh, one of my favorite stories is the, the Confederates had some raiders on horseback ride into Morgantown. And they came from Preston County, they came down the Kingwood Pike, and they got shot at by pikers. <laughs> pikers in the 1860s uh, were... Uh, not Confederate sympathizers. They were pro-Union guys, and uh, there were a few of them who shot at these Confederate raiders, and the raiders came over to confront them, and they acted like, oh, no, we were just hunting. We weren't shooting at you, and those pikers were executed. There is a grave. Um, there's a couple, uh, there's a graveyard with these um, Union, uh, pro-Union pike pikers uh, that shot at these Confederate raiders, and uh they were executed, although one of them actually faked his death. He didn't actually get shot. He just dropped and acted like he was dead and waited till they left and got away. Um, insane. But those Confederate raiders then continued on down the pike, made it to Morgantown, stole some horses, and said that uh, Morgantown was about as fervent a pro-union area as they had ever come across. So um, the further north you go, especially like Wheeling, Morgantown areas, super pro-union, super... Let's be our own state and name it something insane instead of something cool like Vandalia. But uh, a lot of these other areas, eh, some of them super pro-Confederate, some of them eh, half and half or more. Uh, but it is what it is now. Uh, we are 
who we are, right? All right, let's get into the most famous battle, the bloodiest battle, um, super awesome battle. If you're into studying military history, Gettysburg, July 1st to July 3rd. This is the bloodiest battle in American history. Um, it's not the bloodiest day. That was Antietam. Uh, no single day of Gettysburg is quite as bad as Antietam, although all of them are pretty bad, um, well, especially the second and the third. But overall, right, even though some of these battles are going to be longer, no one battle has more people shot uh, than at Gettysburg. So this is the culmination of Lee's second invasion of the North. Um, he has scrabbled together a, a bunch of guys. In fact, uh, his army is up to 75,000. He takes a bunch of people that were going to be sent to the West to fight Grant. And he says, no, 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 no. I need those. He, ta he, he takes them. So he has a slightly larger army than he did before at 75,000 Confederate soldiers. Uh, General George Meade, uh, his army uh, is has had some guys siphoned off. He's down to a mere 90,000. So it is still a massive Union advantage. This is going to be about the most decisive battle of the war. A lot of Civil War battles, at the end of the day, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the statistics, um, both sides just get slaughtered. They just slaughter each other. Um, and it's not going to be any different here. I mean, we're talking 28,000 Union guys become casualties, 28,000 and 23,000 Confederates. Like, we're talking the population of a town like Morgantown in the summer. Just, they're all shot in one way, shape, or form. Um, in a couple of days, it is horrendous. It is a travesty. Uh, it is insanely bloody. But as far as one side clearly being the winner and the other side clearly being the loser, Gettysburg is going to be a very, very clear Union victory. Even though they're going to take more losses, it's a clear Union victory. Um, it's not always clear during the battle. In fact, uh, last... When did I go? I don't remember. Pretty recently. Maybe it was during this school year. It had, it had to have been during the school year. It was getting chilly. Uh, so in the fall. Yeah, yeah, right before basketball season started. In the fall, in like October-ish, maybe early November, my wife and I took a little week, long weekend trip to Gettysburg because she's awesome. And we toured the battlefield. And uh, so most of the pictures on my phone are either of Fort Sumter or of Gettysburg. Um, but when you go through and you go through all of the different locations of the Gettysburg battle, in chronological order, when you go through, okay, here's where the battle started, and uh, then here's where the battle ends on July 3rd. The Union holds on by the skin of their teeth a number of times, uh, especially on the 2nd. They come within a whisper uh, a few times of losing, but they do hold on, and they ultimately uh, kind of decimate uh, Lee's army, and they're going to have to slink back to the south out of Pennsylvania, uh, and not only uh, has the invasion failed and he, he's finally lost a battle and that aura of his invincibility is going to be gone, but his army is largely shattered. Um, he's having a hard time scraping together enough men to put into the field a respectable army that's not, I mean, he just got done winning a battle where he was more, his forces were more than doubled up, and here he is once again with a lot less guys. Lee might be brilliant uh, and almost seem like he, he he has this magical ability to win, but you're not going to win against these kinds of odds every single time. It's just not possible. And finally, Lee's luck, luck Lee's luck runs out. Um, so insanely bloody. Um, the most famous battles uh, or some of the most famous spots of the entire war happen here. Um, we're not going to go through the entire battle. Uh, if you want to, you should look it up because there are some really famous things here like Cemetery Ridge, Culp's Hill, Devil's Den, uh, Little Round Top. Um, if we were in school, I'd show you the clip from the movie Gettysburg where, where the uh, you can kind of see it here. The Confederates on the second day attack this hill called Little Round Top, and uh, they attack the very, 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 very end 
of the Union line. And if that part of the Union line uh, fails, if it crumbles, if it runs away, if they all get killed or captured, then the entire Union line uh, will be exposed and the battle will be lost. And uh, there is a guy uh, named Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain uh, from Maine. He's got this sweet mustache. Um, and he famously is told, you got to hold the hill to the last man. You cannot retreat. They uh, are able to sit on top of this hill and kill Confederates as they attack again and again and again. But eventually, he runs out of ammo. They can't run away. So they fix bayonets and they charge down the hill and they just beat with their guns and stab to death a bunch of Confederates and barely hold on to the hill. There's also a uh, famous along Cemetery Ridge, a famous uh, unit from Minnesota that is exposed and out in the open and on their own. And they take something like 80% of their guys are become casualties, but they hold the line on July 2nd. And so at the end of the day, Lee is thinking like, ooh, I've come really close to winning this thing. In fact, he's attacked on one flank and almost got there. He's attacked on the other flank, almost got there. So on the third day, he orders Pickett's Charge, the famous um, battle or the famous part of the battle where he takes a ton of guys and they line up back at these trees and uh, they march across this flat open field. They have to get through this fence and this road here and the Union is behind this wall and they have all their cannons and stuff. And so these Confederates, and I would show you uh, from the film because you really get a sense of the space and kind of just like how suicidal this charge was, but they actually get really close. A lot of the Confederate guys um, make it to the line, but enough of them have been killed uh, that the Union is able to barely hold on. At the end of Pickett's charge, at the end of uh, the day on July the 3rd, Lee realizes Okay, I'm spent. My men are spent. We have given them our best punch uh, on each flank and up the middle. They held on. They won. He waits around for a counterattack. And just like George B. McClellan, Meade opts to not counterattack. And once again, Lincoln about pulls his hair out and says... What are you doing here, man? You, you held on. You won a battle. Great. But you won a battle on our territory. Go get him. Go destroy Lee. Go invade. Meade sits on his hands. And so he, too, gets fired. But uh, they did hold on. That was good. And the next day, all the way out in the west on the Mississippi River, the last stronghold on the Mississippi River. Falls. Uh, this is a long siege that lasts from May 18th to July the 4th, uh, and Ulysses S. Grant is the guy laying siege. Uh, and Vicksburg is high up on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi in a bend. Right here's you can kind of tell uh, from the, the the different coloring. Uh, the brown is higher elevation. And so Vicksburg is on a higher elevation overlooking the Mississippi River, and it's overlooking this big bend. This um, big turn in the river. And so if you control Vicksburg and you have guns, it's really easy to stop traffic from flowing. You can't just run past it very quick because you got to go real slow around uh, this bend. So Grant surrounds it, says, hey, you can't get out anywhere else. By July 4th, the people and the army inside Vicksburg are out of supplies. They're out of food. I mean, they're, the newspaper is printing the news on wallpaper. Um, I don't know what the news was. I've always been curious. What what are they printing? Like, June 7th, siege continues. June 8th, siege continues. Like, I, I don't know what they're printing, but they're running out of uh, options. And so on the 4th, Vicksburg surrenders, uh, much to their own shame for a long, 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 long time. July 4th was not recognized and celebrated in Vicksburg. Uh, it was not a day uh, to be proud of uh, for the next couple of decades, um, even longer, really, in uh, the South and Vicksburg, because that was the day that phase two of the Anaconda Plan, capture the Mississippi, is completed. So the Confederacy is cut in two. The Union has total access and free reign on the Mississippi River. Um, 
And when you take the big battle, the big victory on July the 3rd at Gettysburg, you combine it with Vicksburg on July the 4th. This is the turning point of the war. Now, it's only July of 1863. The war is going to continue until April of 1865. Unfortunately for all of you, I'm going to have to talk you through that. But it is all downhill from here. Really, the high tide, the, the way they, um, historians will phrase this, the high tide of the Confederacy. So if you think of like, if you've been to the beach and you watch the water come in and it goes a little higher and it goes a little higher and it goes a little higher. And at some point there is a spot where the water gets to, but never gets past. When they charge on July the 3rd at Pickett's Charge, when they get here, that is the high tide mark of the Confederacy. From this point on, thanks to their loss at Gettysburg, thanks to their surrender at Vicksburg, it is all downhill from here. Just going to take a little while. But we are almost done for today. Um, last thing that happens of, of importance in 1863 is the Gettysburg Address, the most famous speech, probably. Um, one of, for sure, but maybe the most famous speech in American history, um, the Gettysburg Address, November 19th, uh, it, there is a national cemetery at Gettysburg. So a lot of these battlefields, um, most of the guys who die there are just buried there because there's, in this war, just so many bodies. You're talking thousands of guys are dead and about to die of their wounds, and it's just too difficult logistically to do much with them, especially because um, a lot of these guys are unidentified. Things like dog tags have not been invented yet. Um, during the Civil War, sometimes people would like write their name, their hometown, their unit uh, on uh, a piece of paper and like pin that to their shirt. So if they're found, they can be identified. But if the only way to identify you is for someone who knows you to recognize your dead body, that can be difficult because... Maybe that your rest of your unit has been shipped out. Maybe a lot of the people who know, knew you are dead. Maybe your body's unrecognizable uh, due to the wounds, due to the amount of time your body was exposed, especially in like the July heat of central Pennsylvania. If your body is left out in the cornfield, in the wheat field, um, for a few days, you might not be that recognizable. So... It wasn't feasible to ship this number of bodies in the kind of conditions they were in home for everyone. So, like at Gettysburg, a lot of these places have cemeteries. Gettysburg has a national cemetery. Um, you can visit it uh, when you go to the Gettysburg uh, battlefield and tour it and look at just row after row after row of uh, all of these headstones. To dedicate it, they have all of these local dignitaries come out and the president of the United States uh, makes an appearance. He gives uh, one of the last speeches, and, and we're talking here in the 19th century, these people could talk like I could, and they could just talk and talk and talk. And so Lincoln uh, is giving a speech shortly after uh, some local politicians who are, have given speeches. And the guy who goes in front of him talked for like two hours. Dude just talked, like just goes on and on. And then Lincoln gets up and he gives a speech that's very short. This is the entire text. This is it. All right. This is the very famous speech of his. It starts four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Three paragraphs. It's short enough that you could memorize it um, pretty easily. And then he gets to the end of his speech and that's it. And nobody really reacts um, because they don't think he's done. They're like, wait, that was two minutes. The last dude went for two hours. So he thinks he bombed. Really, it becomes one of the most iconic speeches in history. And all it is is a very beautifully worded speech uh, that declares what the war is about, reminds these people, here is why these men have died. Right? It's for reunion. Right? He's getting us back together, making sure we are one country like we're supposed to be, like we were as we were founded. And, but don't forget, they also died for a new birth of freedom, right? Who is that birth of freedom for? Well, for all of us, um, but it's for the slaves, right? Don't forget 
We are freeing people. We are, as he talks about in the speech, right, we were founded with these great ideals, but we've never lived up to those ideals. These men have died and are dying to fulfill the ideals of the nation. Um, we have to make sure that we win the war. We cannot quit. We cannot give up. We cannot lose this war or else they will have died in vain. And we got to keep in mind what we're fighting for, why we're fighting, why their sacrifice is a noble sacrifice and not a sacrifice that has been in vain. So, of course, it does go down. Um, it, it's a stirring reminder. It gets printed in papers all across the nation. Um, and it's a stirring reminder to the American people why we are fighting this war, why we have fought, why we must continue to fight. Because really, there is at this point, even if a lot of Confederates don't recognize it yet, there is one hope for the Confederacy to win this war. And it is that the American public become tired of it, become tired of sacrificing, become unwilling to continue to sacrifice, and tell that to Lincoln in an election in 1864 and elect someone else. Because even though we're in the middle of the bloodiest war we've ever fought in, even though we're in the middle of a civil war where, you know, 11 states will not be voting, we will be holding an election in 1864. And if Lincoln does not win, the Confederacy will win the war. So Lincoln is reminding everyone, and it's not a crass, hey, you got to vote for me kind of thing, but he's reminding them, hey, if you don't want these deaths to be in vain, we must win the war. All right, so last thing for today on your activity sheet, how has the war changed by the end of 1863 for both sides compared to where it was when the year started? So number three, you said, hey, how's it? Uh, you said, here's how the war is going for the Union, for the Confederacy. How's that changed? Um, so that will do it for me today. Uh, much shorter, thankfully, at least thankfully for you. I could go on all day, um, but we're going to cut a ton of stuff out of here. Uh, for time uh, purposes, uh, we will come back next time, do 1864, uh, the class after that, do 1865, and that will literally take us to our last class. So um, thank you for watching. Um, hope you're getting a little something out of it, even if you're not doing the work and trying to get the grade, that's fine. Um, if you need to get your grade up, do stuff and get it to me. If you have any questions, need any help, just need someone to talk to so you don't go crazy, um, let me know. I'm here. Uh, miss all of miss all of you guys very much. So um, hopefully be seeing you at some point. Take care.